Welcome to the MBCPA Black History Month podcast series. And today we are absolutely delighted to be joined by Andrew George, who is the president of the National Black Police Association. And welcome, I'm Andy. Hi, Nathan. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm not too bad. And um, thank you for joining us today. Um, Andy, we're going to start by just giving an overview um, of your career and um, just thus far before we move into um, some of the questions that we have um, for you today. Um, Andy is a serving police officer in the Police Service of Northern Ireland, having joined the service in 1999. His police career began at a time of great change within the signing of the Good Friday Agreement and the Patton reforms being delivered in 1998, which brought about wholesale changes to policing in Northern Ireland. At this time, he would have been one of around 10 to 15 officers from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background in a police service of around 13,000 officers. He worked during a targeted recruitment campaign, which utilised positive discrimination for Catholic applicants, which brought the levels of Catholic officers from around 8% in 2001 to around 32% in 2011. The police service also went through a name change, change of symbols and badges and change of uniforms to make them more of a legitimate service in all communities. And this was part of a larger raft of measures which sought to bring a more peaceful society in Northern Ireland. Andy spent the first eight years of his career in a local in a local policing team before moving to the armed response unit for 10 years where he was an operational firearms commander taking charge of firearms teams during spontaneous and pre-planned firearms operations. This involved the use of tactics and less lethal options designed to ensure a safe outcome for all parties, including officers, the public and subjects. He's now an inspector spending the majority of his time completing MBPA duties. And so Andy, I'd like to start um, by asking you, what does Black History Month mean to you? No, for me, Black History Month is that one time of the year where we take centre stage. For too long, we have not been part of the, the wider educational debate, the celebration of what makes the United Kingdom so great. You know, all of the stuff around the First World War, Second World War, you know, with the fact that we played such a, a crucial part in, in ensuring the freedom of the United Kingdom, the impact we had after those two horrific, periods where we come to help rebuild, where we've helped for hundreds and hundreds of years. So for us, it's it's about making sure that we are there and um, that we are being seen because often we're not. Thanks, Andy. Now, this year's Black History Month theme is time for change, action, not words. What does that look like for you as a person of colour? I, th I think there couldn't be a more apt um, title at this moment in time after the murder of George Floyd, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think a lot of communities have now had that their hopes raised that something is going to change. You know, every 20 years we seem to go through this cycle of a big incident happens, there's a, a big outcry, an emotional response, but then it fizzles out again. So for us, what we want to see now is tangible action and results that change the outcome for us, that this, that remove the disparities we all face that create a more fair, equal society for everybody, no matter what your background is. So actions needed. You know, we've had gestures for, for so long. We've had almost pats on the back. What we need to see now is, is people moving on these issues to make sure that now is the time that we do grip this issue and, and make things better for all. Brilliant. And I'm following on from that. Um, Andy, do you think there's enough being done to represent black voices in the criminal justice system? I think it, since Black Lives Matter, there's obviously been a peak in interest. Um, unfortunately, after McPherson, we had the same peak of interest across the criminal justice agencies where your own association, where our association was formed. Um, and, and we had that period, almost our heyday for the MBPA in particular, where we had so much support, so much financial arrangements. We used to have conferences that had a thousand people. We used to go to America, we used to come back and all of those lessons were learned. But whenever a sturdy hit, it was the first thing that disappeared. So for us, you know, it, it's it's where 
voices and, and hearing people are great. But what we want to see is is those processes change that keep giving us dis, disproportionate outcomes for our communities and our members. And we want to make sure that more people come into the criminal justice system to help upskill the, the majority workforce around what the issues and challenges are for people from black, Asian and other ethnic minority backgrounds. That's fantastic. Um, we know that race has been quite a public topic for the police service in recent months. Can you tell us about some of the work that the BPA are doing in this space? Yeah, so the, the, the BPA, whenever we were initially set up, you know, we have around 50 associations, almost 5,000 members across more or less every law enforcement agency, police service in the United Kingdom. We've been working really hard around this for a number of years. Three things that the BPA actually do. One is that internal support, so we will offer support and guidance to the officers and staff members that have discrimination that are being um, disproportionately targeted in misconduct, but also help them to progress and thrive in the organisation. So that support is quite key. We also give strategic advice and guidance to senior leaders and other stakeholders. So we've always met with the National Police Chiefs Council. We've worked with the College of Policing. with may meet the Home Secretary regularly around what the high level issues are. And then we also do the Amplify the Voice of the Community. So the MBPA was born in the aftermath of Stephen Lawrence's murder. We worked and supported the Lawrence family to try to highlight what those issues were and the discrimination within that investigation. So for us, we've tried to use our lived experience, the experience that all of our members have gained over 25 years working in this space. And we've tried to help police and understand that better. So one of the biggest pieces of work that we're working with um, wider policing on is the race action plan which was the national police chiefs council the college of policing's bold kind of um the bold response to george floyd's murder and the rise of black lives matter uh, we have been heavily involved in that thankfully but i think the collaboration between the lived experience of our members and also the infrastructure and expertise of policing i think that's where we make really tangible impactful and meaningful changes and that's what we want to do we want to move away from this role of being a critical friend because that's what we were always described as and for me who really wants a critical friend around them the yeah. last thing i want is somebody following me telling me i've put on weight over covid now um, what i want to see is a critical friend puts you outside the police family it puts you at the end of a process as well and that's whenever we then have to criticize what policing has already done what i've really tried to do is change the outlook on the mbpa and turn us into cultural assets so if we're seen as a cultural asset that adds value to the police service that can help give the perspective of communities, then that puts us inside the police family. It puts us in this start of a process so we can help co-design, co-develop processes, which end up working uh, more effectively for communities whenever they go external. Brilliant, brilliant. And Andy, just to finish up, can you um, tell us what was the biggest barrier that you've had to overcome and within your career biggest barrier for me was probably um career progression um i have faced racism many times um i could give you many examples of you know where i was helping stock the tuck shop in the armed response unit and one of my colleagues said you p word will put up a, a shop anywhere i was called the n word internally as well but i also received that in society so I almost normalized some of those things and it didn't have an impact on how I could work and operate. So whenever the managers then um, made decisions around my career, tried to promote somebody ahead of me that had less qualifications, that's what really struck home. And not so much even the fact that they'd done it, it was the response whenever I raised those that, that as an issue. You know, they sent this person on a two week, uh, they sent two weeks after I raised the issue that I was more qualified, they sent this person on a one day course um, to do what took a week to get my qualification to say that he now equaled my qualification. So the fact that they didn't just sit and hold their hands up, say, you know what, Andy, you're right. And um, we were wrong in our decision making and we'll move on. It was that defensiveness and that uh, um, reluctance to admit that they were in the wrong, reluctance to set things right that really had a big impact. But um, on a positive note, that's what led me towards the our Ethnic Minority Police Association and the Police Service of Northern Ireland. That was what then led me to the National Black Police Association. So for me, it's not about what happened to me. It's about how I can channel that those um, issues and that negative experience to make sure that it doesn't happen to other people. Brilliant, brilliant. And thanks for joining us today, Andy. We really appreciate your time.
No, you're welcome and glad to help. Um, great to be in um, in uh, communication with yourself, Nathan, and we are um, here to support you and the organisation in raising these issues. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Andy. Take care. All the best. Thank you.